Welcome to all of you. So great to see you. I said earlier today, it's really great to see people in person again, isn't it? I think we've spent so much time on Zoom, uh, we forget how to interact with one another. So it's great to see you. For those of you who didn't get a chance to hear my introduction at the early part of the day, um, or who don't know who I am, my name is Judy Fortin. I'm Interim Chief of Communications for UCLA Health. And I'm really happy to be here today with all of our guests. Um, over the next hour, we're going to have a, what I hope is a hearty discussion about the vital role of innovation in healthcare and the role it's playing as we try to come out of this global pandemic. Um, we say try, but here we are with our masks on, right? At least uh, for a while. Um, so during the next hour or so, you're going to hear our panelists, our executive leaders from hospital systems all across Southern California um, answer what I think will be some interesting questions. So let me start with the introductions. And first, I'm so pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, Janice Spiso, who's president of UCLA Health. She's CEO of the UCLA Hospital System and associate vice chancellor of UCLA Health Sciences. Welcome, Janice. So glad to have you today. Dr. Rick Riggs uh, joins us as well. He is senior vice president of medical affairs and Chief Medical Officer for Cedars-Sinai Health System. Thank you, Dr. Riggs, for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Elaine Batchelor joined us last year when we had this conversation. We're so glad that you're back and in person this year. She is CEO of the MLK Community Healthcare. Chad Lefteris joins us from Irvine. Thank you for driving up. He is CEO of UCI Health, and we're so happy to have you here today. And Dr. Anish Mahajan joins us. He's CEO and Chief Medical Officer of Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Thank you all for joining us. Can I say thank you any more times? I'm really appreciative. <laughs> all right, so we're going to go ahead and we'll start the questions. And I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to tell us what's working well at your institutions two years after the start of the pandemic, two years and a couple of months, what innovations and new ideas do you plan to carry forward into the future? And President Spizo, I'll start with you. Well, thank you, Judy, and um, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here um, with the uh, esteemed colleagues to my left. You know, as I reflect back on the past two years and kind of where we are today and, and the success that we've had and the ability to really safely and effectively care for our community, I think of it in kind of three different buckets. The first one is the commitment and teamwork of our staff in working together. And the second one is that dedication and teamwork that we had not only internally, but also externally with the community, with the state and local government, with all of our hospital system partners, with many in the business community that rally to support us. And then the discoveries and innovation is, is really, I think, why we're here today and a, and a place where we feel we can manage what is in front of us. And when we reflect back, when the first um, news of the pandemic came, many of us were already preparing just based on information that we were hearing out of China through our international programs. And as we looked in that first few months, we were really all on a daily basis making major changes to every way that we did business in healthcare. We were talking about this earlier. Sometimes people think healthcare is pretty routine, but we were really on moment's notice changing patient care protocols. And at UCLA Health, we changed over 300 patient care protocols in the first few months. We had to work quickly to set up over 40 testing sites in the community. We had to, with really working on the discovery and innovation, you know, partnered with all of our schools at the university and fortunately had some really rapid discoveries with the development of SwabSeq, allowing us to really rapidly test for COVID-19. And then as we went forward, really participating actively in all of the vaccine trials and also taking care of some of the most critical patients of COVID-19, we learned a lot on how to treat those patients, right? We learned how to use ECMO, we expanded our mobile ECMO program. So the end result, I think, after getting through four surges is we feel pretty confident that going forward, we're better positioned to handle future pandemics. And we also learned how to care for all patients, not just COVID-19, simultaneously, and to keep our facilities running for the community. So I think that's important. The last thing I'll say, which I know my colleagues will talk about as well, is the surge in telemedicine. So going from doing 100 telemedicine visits a week to over 10,000, and that's here to stay. Right now, about 20% of our outpatient visits 
are by telemedicine. Excellent. Now I know why we had so many communications, <laughs> 300 protocols. Dr. Riggs, you come at this question from a very different perspective. Um, what, have, what has changed where you are with innovation in tech? Uh, right. So, um, well, what I'll say, uh, you know, for Janice, uh, she's covered a lot of the uh, big points there. Uh, I am a recovering CMIO. Um, so uh, I have had uh, some exposures to innovation and along the, along the times, and wow, did we accelerate telemedicine. Uh, this was uh, something that we couldn't have imagined doing uh, by planning and encouragement. And uh, what we found out actually in our heart failure patients was actually uh, they did better. Some of the uh, more at-risk groups did better actually accessing care uh, with our telemedicine platforms. So uh, very interesting to understand that. What I would also say is that we learned very quickly uh, that nothing is set in stone. And um, as Janice was saying, we just went back to on-campus masking today. We are you know, titrating and calibrating uh, all the time now. And so monkeypox, huh, OK, <laughs> right? So uh, you know, we got that, right? If that happens, uh, I think you know, less contagious, less, you know, less virulent, all, all those different piece, pieces. We already have a vaccine. Uh, but what I would say is we're ever changing what the care we're delivering. So as you know, the 5 to 11 vaccine, uh, you know, just came out sort of approval for that. So gearing up to do that, uh, we've had multiple rounds of, you know, vaccinations and boosters and all those types of things, as well as treatment protocols. The monoclonal antibodies that we were using initially, we're not using anymore. We've had to shift. And so there's just so many different things that we've learned to be much more agile. Uh, we would make decisions in 13 minutes that would take us 13 months before. Um, and so I think that that is something that I've learned. And the innovation piece is uh, try and fail fast. Um, and obviously, I, I know the technology industry likes those sayings much more than us in medicine, uh, because we don't want to fail any of our patients. And so, uh, but platforms and technology, we can still do that. Dr. Riggs, thank you. Dr. Batchelor? So I think that uh, my colleagues hit on some of the major themes, and I might echo them a little bit. Um, so we still consider ourselves a startup health system and a startup organization that opened in 2015. And we still have that startup culture of adaptability, of problem solving, of creativity, of being action oriented and um, contingency planning and all of that came in um, very handy during the pandemic. And I think that the pandemic really just uh, strengthened our culture and showed us how that culture was uh, an asset in a, in a crisis. And as a result, we emerged from the pandemic feeling that we've been tested again, that we are more cohesive, that we are more confident of our ability to face the challenges that we face every day and future challenges. Um, similar to Johnny's, we also had a lot of emphasis on external relationships and building those relationships, as she said, with government, with uh, philanthropy, with vendors. Um, vendors helped us to stay stocked with the supplies that we need, with our community, and um, an interesting and new relationship for us was developed with media. We learned that the intense interest that the media had in covering the pandemic was an opportunity for us to highlight the longstanding disparities in access and quality to, to healthcare in our community. And we welcomed the media in, we, um, we selectively uh, uh, allowed certain journalists to embed in our health system. We knew it was a risk when we did it. We knew that there was a possibility that we would not like the, or agree with the narrative they would tell. Um, you know, the media has the last word, but we thought it was worth the risk, and it has paid off tremendously in many ways for us um, in raising the visibility of our organization, our ability to address those problems, and the problems in our community. And uh, the journalists that we worked with, Joe Mazingo and Francine Orr, have won several national journalism awards for the coverage that they provided at our hospital. Um, it also was an opportunity to strengthen the relationships within our organization. And by putting our staff and our patients first and being sensitive to their fears and their needs and always prioritizing those, making sure that we had enough PPE, 
um, that we were supporting them in, in every way that we could. Um, we, we gave them bonuses. We did merit increases. I, you know, I was up in the Bay Area recently listening to some nurses talking about how they hadn't had a raise in years. And I thought, wow, we really stayed ahead of that. And as a result, we've had lower turnover of our staff than many other hospitals. Um, I'm also really proud of the fact that our hospital became a CMS five-star hospital during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, our staff were incredibly adaptive. They stayed focused on patient safety. Um, I thought that uh, you know, at any minute, they would come into my office and say, Dr. Batchelor, we can't take care of another patient. We were so disproportionately impacted, but it never happened. And we, we turned conference rooms and um, meditation rooms, you know, every hallways, every space became a patient care area. And I think as we come out of the pandemic, um, we're really focused on advocacy, on connecting the dots for people about why the pandemic was so impactful in low-income communities and um, engaging in the policy advocacy that we need to change the structural problems that we have in our healthcare system. And um, that's really where we are, are today. You brought up so many key points. Mr. Lefteris, uh, Dr. Batchelor said the word confidence. Thinking about what you're taking forward, do you feel confident? Do you feel like you have what you need and you've learned enough to move forward uh, from monkeypox or whatever's coming our way next. Yeah, th thanks for putting that out there, Rick. Uh, th <laughs> thank you, uh, good morning. So um, I'd like to say ditto uh, to a lot of what I've heard and absolutely, I, our, our teammates, 8,000 of them, are more confident and stronger. Yes, they are tired, of course, they are, we all are of this, but they are more focused and more confident uh, as a unit, if you will, than they were going into this. And I'm not sure we would have predicted that, even now looking back. Um, so we're trying to make sure that we harness that and really uh, pull that forward in everything that we're doing. Um, you mentioned community. Uh, you all have mentioned community and the partnerships there. That's something that I think about some of the most amazing phone calls that my office might have received, uh, including, let's say, Oakley sunglasses called when we couldn't get a face shield um, and said, hey, we have a manufacturing plant. How can we help? You name it. Right? We got calls like that from so many colleagues. Uh, that wanted to figure out how they can fit in and help. Um, and to this day, we are so ever grateful for that. Um, luckily, I think, just as Janice shared, uh, we did get wind of this thing coming way in advance, but we didn't really know what it was, and it changed so much. So this constant and frequent communication that you've heard my colleagues mention was so important to be able to turn quickly and then turn again and again and again. So I think our learning that makes me so proud is that we've proven we can do that, because healthcare is notoriously slow. Even when we're fast in healthcare, we're called healthcare fast, which is pretty slow. <laughs> uh, and so we've learned how to be a little bit more nimble than I think we've ever been before. I like that word. Dr. Mahajan, you come at it from also a very unique perspective. As CEO of Harbor UCLA Medical Center, help our, our guests understand what Harbor UCLA is. And again, the question for you is innovations, new ideas that you've brought forward for your team and your hospital. Yeah, no, thank you. And I really appreciate all of the comments. Um, Harbor UCLA, like uh, MLK Community Hospital that Elaine leads, you know, we serve predominantly the Medicaid or Medi-Cal population, predominantly people who live at 200% poverty and lower. And, you know, I, I feel that, you know, sort of taking off what Chad has said, uh, it took a pandemic to force us in healthcare to actually take telemedicine seriously. Uh, we are a culture in healthcare that is slow to innovate uh, when it comes to how we deliver services. but. Um, the pandemic forced our hand, and we saw, you know, much as what's been described, extraordinary efforts by providers, nurses, and administrators to actually, out of necessity, do things differently. And that's a learning that we all want to continue to take as we, you know, try to be faster innovators in healthcare. Uh, but what it also did, at least in the communities that Elaine and I end up, you know, with our staff serving, is expose even further, you know, the disparities were so much further exacerbated by the pandemic. And as we all made the move, including in the Medicaid space to telemedicine, we learned that the digital divide is even more urgent to address. Uh, and so I hope innovation here in this room and in this conference will also think about 
sort of how we bridge that divide even better. And some of it is advocacy and policy levers, but a lot of it is also about the tools that we give patients in a patient-facing way and how we educate our providers to work with patients on brooking that divide. You know, a small example I can give is that, you know, we, with our population, moved aggressively as well to phone and video visits uh, in the ambulatory care setting. And what we found as we did rapid cycle evaluations is that the idea that poor people don't have access to internet is not actually true, but rather that they're gonna use their smartphone and not a computer uh, to access their records and interact with us. And so, you know, as we move to video visits, as you can imagine, people have Samsungs, they have Apples, they have all different kinds of smartphones, and we have Cerner, somebody has Epic, um, but it was too hard in many instances for our most needy patients to figure out how to get on, to get on the video visit. And so we partnered with community organizations to create tech ambassadors who would you know, go beyond what the nurse would do to prepare a patient before their video visit, make sure that they can actually connect uh, via their phone to us. And so these are steps that we're all just trying to figure out, but I am sure there are technical solutions that are better than sort of people solutions to help us do this more efficiently. So I'm curious, do, do all of you talk? Do you have a chance to get on calls together, Zoom or otherwise? It yeah. seems like idea sharing becomes important. Yeah, in we do actually, and you know, a credit to our Hospital Association of Southern California. Uh, during the pandemic, we were meeting some weeks three times a week, sometimes daily. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> daily. Um, and it was really great because we were able to really just get a pulse check on what was happening at each Place. We still now meet routinely, but um, the calls would, depending on what surge we were in, it would sometimes be daily, three times a week, two times a week. And our goal was to make sure that we didn't have anyone get to crisis standards. So there was a lot of sharing, a lot of issues that we were having. We could communicate with the uh, state and local officials. We could communicate with the Secretary of Health. Um, not only were we having challenges initially with the patient load, but the original vaccine rollout plan was a little clunky because we had such limited vaccine. So we had to work together to say, how are we going to distribute this? We developed a social vulnerability index to also help assist with that. But I think um, it was more collaboration than we've really ever had. So to be able to pick up the phone, Dr. Bachelor, and know that you could call and have resources or share ideas, what did that mean to you? Um, it meant a lot, and actually, uh, I wrote a letter to the governor on Christmas Eve. I was sitting in my office, and it was, you know, sort of the peak of COVID, and this was a year before last Christmas, and I had noticed that the, um, the volume of COVID patients wasn't really evenly distributed across hospitals because Health and Human Services started publishing the data. So I just sat down and I wrote him a letter. I said, let me tell you what's happening in this community and at this hospital. And um, by December 26, there was a team from the state and the county at our hospital. Um, they responded that quickly. And the, the state and the county also then organized these daily, what became weekly, daily phone calls where we had the state represented the county um, the CEOs of all of the area hospitals, the hospital association, and it became a forum for sharing information, for making sure everyone was up to date, for sharing resources, and um, for coordinating with the government representatives. And I think it was incredibly important that that, that evolved. And we were very grateful for the um, tremendous support that we got as well from the state and the county, which included um, the National Guard coming in with um, respiratory therapists and nurses and um, supplies and equipment. So it was incredibly important. So one of the things that I learned was to, to communicate effectively and to ask for help. And you know, if you do that, there will be a response. Life-saving response. Dr. Riggs, I just want you to jump in here because you've had a previous role that I think may, may inform the audience about where you come from and your perspective in informatics. Were you sharing information as well? I mean, we're, very, we're all very competitive in this space. However, this changed during the pandemic, right? Globally, it changed. Right. Well, uh, what I would say is that we became more reliant on data uh, and, and really, uh, you know, uh, at our fingertips to make decisions, right? We uh, both uh, regionally, which was very important. Now, not that there weren't, uh, there wasn't a significant burden for the data reporting <laughs> that had to occur, 
Uh, but the data was very, very uh, important for us to understand how to make decisions as a community, uh, really, because uh, as you know, we've been in multiple different uh, waves and had to make multiple different decisions about where we're going next. Uh, what I will say, however, is that um, you know, many of the analysis that we have done on our internal population of, of COVID patients has also been insightful as to how we can provide better care. For instance, we know that our COVID patients at our organization during our first couple of waves, they had a significantly higher uh, incidence of bloodstream infections. And, and we don't really understand that yet. And so we'll understand more about that data as we move through things, uh, but also understanding that uh, we need to care for the majority of our patients um, with the exception of a few peak waves, we're still non-COVID, right? We were still caring for the rest of our community, um, you know, critical surgery, uh, you know, oncology, cardiology, et cetera. And so I think that sometimes is overlooked in some of the data pieces where we focus. Um, the other thing that I would say is that um, LA County was particularly very, very, um, uh, I'll say quick to respond in many efforts and say, like, how can we do X, Y, Z? How can we distribute uh, the vaccines the way we need to? How can we distribute PPE? How can we set up reinforcements? And, um, you know, obviously we've all learned a lot through the cooperation, but also the platforms that have been established and the connections. And those connections will be long lasting. Very good. Talk about connections. Uh, Mr. Lefteris, uh, UCI, part of UC Health. Um, I would imagine you leaned on your, your fellow peers at, at the other UCs. Um, tell us a little bit about how that impacted your ability to move forward and do your work. Yeah, it's, it's really nice to be able to have an instant peer network uh, with sure Denise is. and my colleagues around the state. And, um, and it's remarkable how similar the issues were. And actually, as we also talked to colleagues around the country, right? So you can remove your name badge and where you were sitting on that Zoom screen uh, and the issues were actually the same at that moment in the earliest days. And uh, so I think we took a lot of comfort in being able to share, just as you've heard some of the other comments already, but within the UC health system specifically, being able to go very deep and leveraging our scale, spanning the whole state. Frankly, we didn't have some of the supply chain challenges that some of our other colleagues around the country had uh, because of that early planning and that scale and that cooperation and coordination. So we're very fortunate for that, um, and it was a good test, frankly, because we've not been tested like that before. So, so we tried to leverage that, and um, uh, Janice, we're still together twice a week, actually, speaking of calls, just to make sure that we are coming out of this, again, as, as strong as possible as a, as a whole. I think that sounds great. Dr. Mahajan, uh, Mr. Lefteris talks about a test. Um, if you had to grade how you all work together, uh, would you give it an A, A plus? I'm a tough grader, okay. so uh, I'll just be honest. I, I, I think we, you know, this to me in, you know, I've been in, I've been in this, in healthcare leadership 15 years. This was a tremendous achievement. Uh, I was on these calls every day with many of you and it really was amazing. Uh, and, I, and for that, I, I really feel hopeful about the future. I think there are things we learned uh, to make the next time around better. And one of those things I would argue is that we don't have a public health data infrastructure where we can very readily understand how to load balance, whether it's supplies or even patients, right? We had in South Los Angeles, hospitals putting patients uh, in places they shouldn't be. Uh, and you know we didn't have an easy way of knowing where the beds were available and then moving patients around quickly. That's something that we should all be working on now with our colleagues in the audience, figuring out what we can do so the next, when the next pandemic comes around, hopefully it's not monkeypox, uh, we are ready to, to address that. Very good. So the next question I have, and President Spizo, I'll address this to you. Um, so it's been a long two years, I know, um, at UCLA Health and for all of you uh, where you work. What strategies do you have for sustaining resilience among your leadership and workforce teams? It's so important right now. I mean, I think we saw that, you know, by the time we hit our third and fourth surge, um, we were already doing a lot for wellness and trying to do things to boost morale, but people were just really physically very tired. And then particularly when we had the Omicron variant, while we weren't seeing more COVID patients hospitalized, we were bursting at the seams with all of our regular patients and we were having really double the number of staff sick calls out per day because our staff were at home with Omicron. And so that really put a tremendous tax on the people working already to do extra shifts, double shifts. I think our staff really rose to the occasion in such an amazing way. We did a lot of things, as Elaine mentioned, to try to keep really 
front and center all of their needs and the, the fact that we were really trying to address shortages. But I think right now, as we we've, we've did town halls, we do frequent rounds, um, what, what we're really doing is looking to say, how can we not only help them with their physical well-being, but a lot of the mental stress that people went through. Our COVID-19 units saw a lot of death right in the early phases and that was very challenging. They also saw a lot of amazing successes, people that we would have on ECMO for months that walked out of the hospital and, and did well. But the mental toll of that was really something that we are really trying to get our arms around now. We're using some of the tools that we have in our Depression Grand Challenge app so that staff can have those. We're also doing a lot for mindfulness. We just had Nurses Week, and instead of a lot of trinkets and gifts, people really just wanted time to have small forums where they could share their thoughts and, and try to build resiliency. I know everyone is working on it at a local and national level. There just aren't a lot of big secrets or you know success to share when it's just people are exhausted. Dr. Riggs, you agree with that? Uh, absolutely, and um, just to highlight um, the staff uh, piece during the Omicron, um, during a two-week period, we had 2,000 uh, patients, I mean, 2,000 employees uh, that were infected. It was, I mean, that's just, it's, it's incredibly to, and incredible to think about. Um, we've done some things that are uh, very uh, moving and meaningful for the staff. Uh, one was uh, a ceremony at dusk of, of letting go uh, and sort of really, you know, having people drop their thoughts into you know, water where the paper dissolves. Uh, you know, really a, a sort of a, a physical uh, experience, uh, but also an emotional experience. Um, I would say that uh, humility uh, for staff and saying we don't know, but we're gonna keep you safe, working, and informed. Um, humor, I mean, we've all had to be just, you know, acknowledge that uh, this sometimes is just unbelievable, right? Um, and so, uh, and that, and then connection. I mean, what we know is that uh, from our surveys internally, if one question, if, if my manager asked me how, I, how I'm doing in the past uh, period of time was uh, correlated with engagement. People want people, they want their leaders to connect with them. And in uh, our Zoom and, you know, sort of, other WebEx and Teams type meetings, uh, emotional connection is hard. Nobody's built that app yet. This is really great if you guys could take this, where you can actually An say, idea. oh, hi, Elaine, it's so good to see you, right before you come in, and oh, did you get that note about, we just don't have that, because there's just one uh, platform, unless you're in a breakout room. So you guys get on that, that would really be helpful. I think it's a call to action for all of you. Dr. Batchelor, connection, engagement, yes. those words are important. Yes, so ditto to everything that they just said, you know, really important for your employees to know that you care about them, that their needs matter, um, and doing all of the things that, that we just talked about. I think the pandemic has brought one change that I think is really important in healthcare. When I trained as a doctor, you didn't talk about your feelings. You didn't talk about the impact that the, the type of work you did was having on you emotionally or mentally. And I think that um, th through the pandemic, we've come to recognize and accept more readily that we need to address that aspect of our caregivers. And so some of the things that we did, we actually hired a, um, a behavioral health counselor who offers one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions with staff. and also connects people with external counseling. We invited in spiritual leaders who do regular rounds with our staff and are there to talk to them about their feelings, to pray with them, to give them a hug. Um, one of the other things we did that I think is, um, was unique and special is that we developed a post-discharge COVID clinic where our staff or doctors and nurses who took care of those patients in the hospital could see them in an outpatient setting. So the hospitalist who took care of a patient or the nurse who cared for a patient in the ICU um, would go and see them when they came back for their outpatient visit. And it allowed them to see that some people did make it through that experience to the other side. It wasn't all death 
and destruction, and that there were people who were healing and recovering as a result of the work and support that they had offered. And you know, one of the other innovations that we implemented was something called Schwartz Rounds, which are rounds that staff um, have where they talk about the, um, the, the social and behavioral impact of being a caregiver. So I think that is one of the good things that came out of this. You know, when I was trained, the major coping mechanism we had was humor, um, but now I think it's much healthier that we allow people to talk about the difficulty of the work that we do. Mr. Left Harris, what are you doing at UCI? And thanks for bringing up the Schwartz round. Super powerful and important thing that we do as well, um, and our colleagues get a really a big lift out of that. Uh, you know. We kind of return to the basics and a lot of what you're already hearing, whereby we really took a pause and made sure that we are trying to over-communicate every possible resource, because you heard some amazing resources. We all had, had lots of those and more for our colleagues to help them. But at times, there's also this interest or disinterest sometimes by coworkers to, well, that's not for me, right? Or it's a sign of weakness or whatever it may be. and so. Really breaking that down was where we spent a lot of time. Uh, and we brought in, you, you wouldn't believe the different resources that we've rolled out. We have an Integrative Health Institute. If you want acupuncture, acupuncture, massage, if you want financial well-being, we'll bring in the financial experts. You name it, right? We had everything coming in, and we realized that they just weren't getting tapped into enough. So then we had to flip that. Um, and then uh, Janice also mentioned the amount of communication that's happening differently, whether that's in a town hall fashion, or uh, frequent rounding, uh, you know, we have, all of us have multiple locations and sites and uh, the complexity is hard to be in front of everyone. And so being very present uh, throughout all this has been so powerful. The feedback we keep getting, uh, I keep thinking that we'll do less town halls because we've continued them, um, but we still have thousands and thousands of people on every Zoom town hall on all shifts. Um, and so we're not stopping that, right? And so that's another indicator of how engaged I think our workforce is and how much they also still need frankly. So I think we have a long way to go. I remember the earliest days when our first few coworkers went out, uh, Rick, thinking about your comment, um, and you couldn't go to the grocery store and buy anything. Remember that? Like, you couldn't get toilet paper. Well, I still don't know why, but you could not get toilet paper. So we opened up a commissary and said, come get the paper goods you need, come get the, the dry <laughs> goods you need, right? And, and that was such a huge deal for our coworkers. It, it was not a very costly thing, but it was just one less thing I wanted that nurse, that that cook in the kitchen, whomever, to worry about when they left that long shift that they now had to go wait in line at the grocery store or wherever on their way home for hours. Uh, so those are some of the things that we worked on. Again, small things, but in the end, they ended up adding up to be very, very huge. In the those end. are key points. Dr. Mahajan, I'm so sorry. You're, you're at the end of the line well, here. Not, not, no worries. Are so important I'll just us. add one other thought. And, you know, I, I think um, physicians and nurses, you know, the culture is you show up and, and you work and you work. and Work-life balance is very hard for those those kinds of professionals and hospital administrators. And and I think what I'm hopeful about in the future, and we're not the only industry contending with this, obviously, but you know, how do we do telework? How do we redesign the jobs of nurses and doctors so that telework is not something a nice to have and it's not an add-on, but we actually integrate it to a better place? for their fulfillment and their abilities and for our patients. And, and that's going to require us to think about, you know, actually take remote monitoring seriously, not just for our heart failure patients, but for all of our patients, right, where it makes sense. So how can we have it that a doctor or a nurse can do their job some portion of the week at home when their kids are still there, but also take great care of their patients? Those are the innovations I hope come out of, of what we've faced in the pandemic. I love that you've given some challenges to the group here, so keep thinking. Um, um, smart Judy, people. can I yes, throw in just one absolutely. other thing as I was sitting here thinking about it? Um, I think there are a couple of other things that help you build resilience in your staff, and I think one of them is giving them autonomy, you know, them feeling like they have agency. Empowering them? Yes, yes. yes. And, you know, one story comes to mind during the pandemic, um, many hospitals, including ours, implemented no visitor policies. And you know, we felt like we were on pretty solid ground in doing that. One of our ICU nurses came to us and said, I don't think it's right that people die alone without their loved ones. I think we need to change the policy. And we did. And I think it's being responsive and you know, empowering your staff to come forward and 
you know, tell us what they think ought to be changed and to listen to them and, and act on their recommendations is part of building resiliency in, in your team. Those are tough decisions yeah. no, because there's risk. I would just like to add on that. I think you know that feedback, constant feedback from our staff and their willingness and dedication to put the patient first really made us push a lot of the rules. And even on our weekly calls, we would be sharing some of those. And one of the things um, at UCLA Health, thanks to our innovation program, we actually accelerated innovation grants to staff to come up with some new ideas around everything that we were managing. And I think it does empower them to use all of their knowledge and training to say, we can do this better. And you know, we just had great support from the business community with a lot of those ideas. It's amazing how many people stepped up, yeah. both internally and externally. So as part of your hospital system missions and visions, I'm curious, how are you impacting the communities you serve with innovative ideas? Impacting the communities, and President Spiso, I'll start with you. Yeah, so um, I'll start. I mean, one of the things that um, we noticed, and again, we're a very large health system, four hospitals, 200 clinics through the community. We knew that there were still patients who had barriers to access, particularly the large homeless population we have in Los Angeles with about 66,000 patients a night people who are experiencing homelessness. So we started a mobile outreach van. There are some other groups in the city that provide those and really targeted four areas, particularly where we were seeing many patients come into our emergency department with really things that we could meet them in the community to provide. And so we launched that program in January um, with two vans. We'll be up to six in the next few months. And it really is about removing barriers to access because just because people have coverage, right, doesn't mean they can actually get in for care even through multiple sites. So it's about really reaching out. So I was just pleased that it was an idea that came from our staff in looking at the data, looking at patients who we were treating and saying, we need to do better. So that was just one of many of the innovative ideas that came forward. And I'll put my PR hat on. It's called the Homeless Healthcare Collaborative. So you'll hear more about that. And coming. again, special thanks to the community who partnered with us to make that happen. Absolutely. Dr. Riggs, I'd like you to address this as well. Yes, and I can add on to that. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, again, also knew is that, uh, well, especially when we were running out of beds, was that we could care for these folks at home if we were able to, if they had a home, to understand how we could actually care for them out of the hospital and um, deploy things like pulse oximetry directly from the emergency department, which is something that you know normally, if you're even you know vaguely hypoxic, uh, right? We're we're thinking about which way this is this going to go. Uh, but as we understood more about the disease process, we've also developed a healthcare in action, which is uh, for folks to have a 30-day um, mobile van that will link up with them to deliver care, and they are given cell phone. Uh, cell phones with uh, solar chargers, uh, actually, so that, that we can contact them. And so this is a very innovative program we're looking at. Uh, we're actually funding the 30 days post, uh, you know, discharge or discharge from the emergency department or from the hospital um, for care, and they have a warm handoff uh, for to a PCP. So we're understanding and trying to innovate in some of the same spaces. Um, additionally, we're doing um, direct grant making to uh, agencies that are uh, trying to ad address uh, issues like those experienced in homelessness, uh, the mental health pieces, building uh, you know, uh, capacity within community organizations to actually address healthcare disparities and understand what they are um, in, a, in a way because they're on the front lines. So I think that there's, it, it's going to take uh, all of us really uh, up here to really begin to continue to iterate. Um, we, there, there will be technology solutions that may help advance this. Um, I, will, I just want to tag on to a little bit about the telemedicine and just say uh, we as physician educators and educators uh, need to begin to understand um, just like we would look at what, what might, might uh, say a you know, supportive care medicine note or a hosp hospice note, what actually comprises a, a competent, capable uh, telemedicine visit for our specialties. Right? We have, we've just sort of done some duct tape duct tape on it and sort of like said, okay, well, we think this is what it is, and then we need to advocate for those type of things to be in regulations and uh, for billing and other things, uh, because right now we're just doing sort of more of the same in a different mold. Very good. So Dr. Batchelor, the question was, um, 
maybe it seems obvious. How are you impacting the communities you serve? Um, well, I'll, I'll ask, answer that using maybe an, an example of how we've leveraged technology to do that um, during the pandemic and that we've continued. So we actually created a new digital front door. That's a terminology that we hear a lot in the tech world is, you know, digital front door. I used to wonder exactly what that meant. Um, so we, we developed an artificial intelligence powered chat bot that we put on our website. Um, our chat bot is named Mia. Um, Mia's in English and in Spanish, and about 25% of the users are in Spanish. And it does several things. It provided the community and continues to provide the community with up-to-date information on COVID. That was particularly important when the community needed to know about things like, where do you go to get tested? You know, how do I get a vaccine? Should I come to the emergency department? Um, so we used Mia to also provide symptom screening. Um, so she recognizes over 3,200 symptoms and over 800 conditions. Um, thirdly, she connects people to the appropriate source for care. So it helped people figure out, you know, should I come to the emergency department or is this more of an urgent care um, type of visit and helped keep our emergency department um, capacity available for COVID patients. Um, in conjunction with Mia, we also implemented uh, urgent care telemedicine on demand. So a person, even a person who wasn't technically one of our patients, anyone who lived in our community, we, we bought a telemedicine vendor and we connected it um, to Mia. And um, we've had a surprise bonus from Mia. One of the things that we've learned is that um, we can see the number of people who are using Mia who are having symptoms of COVID. And what we learned is there's about a two, two week lag between people asking about COVID symptoms and then needing care and needing to come in to be treated, um, you know, between, I'm sorry, exposure to COVID and then the symptoms. And we are actually at a point where we can kind of predict when we're going to see an uptick in people coming in with COVID following um, their exposure. That's important, isn't it? And, and also UCLA Health also has a chat bot. Anyone else do a chat bot on their website? Okay, so that's innovation in action, right? That's what we're talking about. Mr. Left Harris, I wanna give you a chance to answer. So I think I'll maybe go to where Rick was going about the amount of things that we were able to move quickly on. We mentioned telehealth, of course. Uh, we were already doing a lot of investigation around what more can we do in the home, and you brought this up as well. So uh, I was very pleased to say when all the headlines were how many ICU beds, how many ICU beds, we were able to move patients out of our facilities quicker uh, by doing and extending monitoring in the home. Uh, at any one point, I think we had 52 patients at, at its peak at one moment at home. Well, that's about two nursing units full when we didn't have extra beds, right? That were at home being monitored safely and were, were discharged a little bit sooner with amazing outcomes, to your point. <laughs> so it can be done. Um, but I think that we also needed that sort of shot in the arm to move uh, further and we continue to go into that. On the other side of the equation, we also partnered to do more care in your home with a third party. Uh, the name is Dispatch Help, you, you may know it. Uh, they're based out of Denver and markets around the country. We're the first in California to have them do in-home urgent care visits. So through that uh, online portal, the, the digital front door, right, you can also now get access to have, I like to say we've gone full circle where the physician or advanced practice provider will come to your home and see you as well. So that also helped with uh, eliminating readmissions, perhaps, due to COVID and other things as well. Excellent. And that continues today, regardless of COVID. Terrific. Dr. Mahajan. Yeah, um, I, I think all of us are working on this aspect. When I think about your question about community, um, you know, I think about the fact that during the pandemic, uh, it so happened we had another sort of, another kind of surge of recognition by our nation about systemic racism, about systemic how our systems, all of our systems lead to these disparities in people of color who then have worse health, health outcomes among other outcomes. And we saw people take to the streets. And so I think all of our health systems are reckoning with that as well in the setting of watching the disproportionate impact of not just COVID but other illnesses in the setting of COVID affecting people of color in our community. And I think that you know, our staff is pulling for it, we in leadership are pulling for it, and we are casting about how do we actually do this? How do we honor uh, our communities by looking at these forces that affect our ability, right or wrong, to deliver great care? 
And I think that, you know, we in the county of Los Angeles Health System, Harbor East being one of the four hospitals in our, in our health system enterprise and the clinics, you know, we've gone on a, on a, on a massive, uh, you know, strategic and engaged approach with our faculty and our staff, with our communities and community partners to say, you know, we've been doing it this way and we want to learn with you and have your input about how we do this better. And, and how do we begin to, you know, we in healthcare only deal with a piece of it. And Elaine talked about it earlier, but, but we can be very effective advocates uh, where the levers are to really help us get past some of this stuff. But what I would say about innovation as it relates to this is that one of our biggest challenges in the chatbot is so cool that Elaine described is that, you know, it was very difficult um, to overcome or to have the time for providers to address the questions and the mistrust that patients came forward with regarding vaccine or antibody therapy or am I safe enough to go for this other procedure when I just had COVID, the, ed the amount of time it would take to educate our patients and then our community to do this wasn't built into how we're reimbursed, was not something that anyone really had the time for. So what happened? Our doctors decided after their, after their duties to go and do community events and to try and spread the message. And we want to see better use of electronic tools. We want to see better strategies about how we educate those communities that are understandably, because of the history of oppression that they've suffered, how do, they, how do we communicate to them the science? And I think that's something Thing that is crucial for all of our health because pandemics affect all of us. Very good. Any other follow-up remarks that you wanted to make? Uh, I would just like to follow up on the equity piece. Um, I would say that um, there's been a lot of, obviously, a lot of um, needed attention uh, and movement uh, uh, in that space. And what I would say is I think that uh, us understanding what equitable care delivery looks like uh, is kind of where quality was probably 20 years ago. Uh, people would say, okay, you know, uh, well, are we delivering quality care? Is it safe? Is it quality? I think we need to begin to ask that about every, you know, initiative that we're delivering. Are we delivering e equitable care? And are we actually designing it that way uh, to be successful? Because I think until we get to that point, uh, I think we may iterate around the margins, but we're not going to actually fundamentally change how we're delivering care. Okay, very good. Dr. Batchelor. And I would say that the majority of my time now is spent talking about that, advocating for it, and it's going to be much harder than we think to achieve. There's a lot of talk about it, but not as much action. And many of the root causes of inequity in our healthcare system are deeply structural and policy based. And if we are going to achieve equity, we are going to have to go directly at those structures and policies. And what I mean by that, um, the majority of our community that we serve is insured by Medicaid. And in California, the Medicaid program has uh, decided to cover lots of people and lots of services, but we have the third lowest provider payment rates in the country. And that means that a lot of the coverage is illusory when you can't find a provider who is willing to deliver services for what's being paid. And the, what's being paid through Medicaid is a fraction of what Medicare and commercial insurance pay. And right there you have a structural inequity that doesn't make sense. And that is disproportionately impacting our communities of color. So I think that it's easy for us to talk about equity, but it's going to be a lot harder for us to actually achieve it and to make the serious changes that we need to make as a, as a country and as a state um, to, to get there. Certainly there are challenges ahead yeah. for all of us. Yes. I would just add on that, too. I think, you know, there are so many other social determinants of health that just the health care alone isn't one piece, as we all know. And one of the things we're pursuing at UCLA Health, along with other UCs in the system, is that healthcare anchor network um, to look at how we can really begin to influence, you know, the food deserts, influence the business community to make some of those changes that were just mentioned so that we can actually really be doing more um, to really address health disparities because we just touching one piece of it isn't going to get us there. That's encouraging and a lot of work. 
So, President Spizo, you've worked with me a couple times now on yes. these panel discussions. I always like to leave our guests with an upbeat uh, opportunity or moment. So my last question for all of you is what makes you feel optimistic about the future in your role? And I'll start with you, President Spizo. So for me, certainly um, working here in Los Angeles and with the Southern California community, the ability that we have to really partner with all of you from the healthcare side to really look at how we can address some of these very challenging problems to improve the health of our community. Um, for me, I think that's so exciting and really, you know, want to thank the business and the entrepreneurial community for everything that has happened over the past two years that have really assisted us in seeing things really come forward in a much faster way. So I remain optimistic really because of that partnership. So thank you for everyone for stepping up, right? Dr. Riggs. And I would uh, second that and say that we live, we're blessed to live in Los Angeles where we have uh, an overwhelming number of academic and innovative uh, institutions and also a really innovative community model and based uh, piece, uh, pieces that have, have partnerships and are willing to reach across to other providers in order to innovate and understand where we go. I, I totally agree with the policy pieces uh, that we, uh, we are encouraged. Um, I'm encouraged by the fact that people, at least now, are asking and they understand that, um, you know, that they're, where, where, they're, where they're sitting in their view is not what necessarily is going to make things happen for our patients in our community. So I'm encouraged by that as well as by, you know, uh, events like this where we can bring together folks and hear ideas about how we can move things forward. Make things happen, Dr. Bachelor. You're doing that, right? What makes you op feel optimistic? Um, it, I think that's exactly right. What makes me optimistic is the belief that we can affect change and the example of the people that have come before me and the people around me who are affecting change. And I think we, I almost feel like we're obligated to be optimistic and to believe in that because if you don't believe you can change things, you're not going to change things. Um, over spring break, I took my two college sons to visit Brian Stevenson. Um, he's a lawyer who graduated from Harvard Law School and then moved to Alabama, where he represents um, poor inmates who are on death row, many of whom have been wrongly convicted. And my son asked him the same question. He said, how do you do such difficult work and remain hopeful? And um, his answer was pretty similar. You know, it, it's because you're focused on affecting change, on helping people, on solving problems. And it's the little successes that you have along the way, I think, that encourage you to keep going. So I think it's something that we're obligated to, to do, to believe in change. Mr. Left Harris, I bet you agree with that, too. I, I love those comments, uh, Elaine. And, and um, I got to tell you, though, guys, there were some days when optimism was hard to find. Right, let's be very clear. Uh, but as leaders, and I can tell by the colleagues on the stage here, um, you did an amazing job leading your organizations through this. And um, for me, it's where we started, perhaps, Judy, which is our teammates, our colleagues, the caregivers, and I, and I mean ours, all of ours that are in this space, that, that gives me great optimism for what comes next. Um, they've come through this incredibly, and they've done everything we've asked of them and more. Um, and uh, so it's kind of like bring it on, right? Like whether it's monkeypox, whatever, who knows? Um, and the pace at which we've proven that we can do this is where we started as well, right? The pace at which we can now move differently within the traditional healthcare provider space, I think is what gives me the greatest optimism. All right, and Dr. Mahajan. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm just picking up on what Chad said. I, I, I'm very optimistic about um, our teamwork and teams, both the smallest team in the hospital to the teams that we even have on, on, this, on the dais here. Uh, there's been an extraordinary record of teamwork because of the pandemic, and we're just going to build on that. That brings me hope. Um, it also brings me hope from my earlier comments that we're going we're gonna to call out things that are really affecting our ability to do well, and, and that is you know, this idea that we, we really do need to address disparities. And, and I feel that there's a true reckoning with that occurring across all of our different disciplines and industries. And, and that's going to that's gonna help us a great deal, too. So those are things that make, make me very hopeful. 
Very good. Well, we're starting to wrap up our discussion, and I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to say a few final words. I'm starting with you, Dr. Mahajan. <laughs> You've been uh, very patient. Oh, well, I was just getting relaxed to hear all the comments. And, uh, <laughs> You're just getting started. I, I mean, I, I would just say that I really appreciate an event like this. I, I feel that our best is when we bring different disciplines together. Uh, and, you know, in, in what I saw outside and, and the folks that are here, a few conversations I've had so far, uh, I'm very hopeful about the creative minds come and challenge us in leadership uh, to say, hey, what are your problems and how can we help you think about your problems? And let's, let's, take, let's take you through some opportunities to try to address them. And, you know, half of those ideas will tell you get out of here never could happen. But some of them will work uh, and we, will, we should have the courage to take them up. Courage. I like that word. Mr. Left Harris, your final words. Yeah, I would say when we say get out of here, come back uh, as well. Um, so I, I would also just add that, you know, when we think about how far we've come, the ability to be here with you, thank you for having us. I, I think there is a really powerful moment to think that we will never return to the pre-pandemic way of living in the healthcare space. We will not. We cannot. We must not. We're going to need your help with that because I believe that the future for us as providers is partnering with best-in-class providers of other services and working together to do that. So that's my challenge to all of us in this room and beyond, um, because I think that's another very, very important element that makes me very optimistic about what we can do together and change the way we've delivered care. I like that. Dr. Batchelor. So I guess I would say that to those of you who are um, creative, innovative thinkers and who may have thought of healthcare as being um, kind of old school and, and not very innovative. Um, I think you would find that there's a receptivity to that that you may not have anticipated. Um, a lot of the work that we do in healthcare is very adaptive. Um, we were talking before the panel started about how, you know, if you work in a hospital in healthcare, you're always confronting um, something unexpected and new, and you really have to learn to deal with uh, new problems every day. So I think that we are good partners for creative, innovative solutions. And you know, we know that we need them, and we are ready to embrace them. Excellent. Dr. Riggs. Yes, yeah, so um, I would say that, uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me here today. Um, I am uh, inspired by my panelists and their comments. And um, that's what I think the connection piece of listening to new ideas um, it's putting yourself out there to be in spaces that may not seem relevant um, at times, but really um, spark a new idea or a new concept. Um, I think that we all missed uh, that collaboration and exchange of ideas as we, uh, you know, as we moved through the pandemic and had some isolation and pieces. And so, what I would say is, don't forget that that the we is you know, much more powerful than the I, and uh, the exchange of ideas can really uh, you know, sort of be additive and can be a catalyst for lots of great things to come. Excellent. And President Spizo, you get our final, final word. And I would just say, I think you know, one of the, the biggest silver linings that came out of what we all just went through is really at a global level, we've really shown the importance not only of investments in public health, but also investments in research and discovery. And for us working at a major research institution, um, I feel we have really a chance to really show the value of investments in research to really lead us to better treatments, better cures um, in our role of improving the health of the public. So I, I think that's a really important piece. And we couldn't do it without great partnerships from the community. Well said. Well done to all of our panelists. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking them for being here today.